I want to talk today about deafness and sign language as a DEI issue, uh, rather than only as a disability issue. And I, I changed the wording of my title from just a disability issue to only a disability issue to be clear that I mean this um, as an additional way of looking at uh, deafness and sign language. Um, and with that, I will explain myself further as we go along. Um, so I wanna start with uh, the uh, general idea of deafness and disability and DEI. And to say, first off, that the case um, has already been made for all disabilities to be uh, considered as DEI issues. And Kelly said that uh, as part of her introduction as well. Um, and what we mean by that is to view disabilities from a social rather than a medical perspective. And in the case of deafness, in order to be clear about that, we need to distinguish deaf with a small d from deaf with a capital D. Deaf with a small d is the audiological status, hearing status. And deaf with a capital D is the linguistic minority status. And they're different. Why the difference? Well, the deaf community is bound together by use of sign language, a minority language. And to have a language, there needs to be a community of users. And a population, any population, that uses its own language over time creates its own culture, what has been called the deaf world. So from a linguistic perspective on DEI, um, linguistics is a, a DEI enterprise in a number of ways. For example, inclusion, we note all humans have a language. Equity, all languages are of equal linguistic status. No languages are more or less complex, and there are no primitive languages. Diversity, there are roughly 6,000 languages, plus or minus, we're not really sure. It depends how you count, what you consider to be a language as opposed to a dialect, and also they are disappearing at a rather rapid rate. No two languages are the same, not even related languages. And this is also going to be relevant. Sign languages are not signed spoken languages. So American Sign Language is not, repeat, not signed English. They're different. Everyone learns language using the same human brain. And any person can learn any language no matter what you may feel about having to take a language requirement, we know you can do it. Lewis asked, what do all human languages have in common? This is the study of universals. And how does each language differ? This is the study of typology. So what about deaf people? And here I put deaf in single quotes because I'm not making the big D, little d distinction here. Deaf people are taught language their entire school career, from the time they enter school until the time they leave school. And I will return to the question of how well they end up doing that. That's part of what I'll be reporting today. And some deaf people develop usable speech. Some deaf people master a second or a third language. And yes, I have known deaf people who learn four, five, or more. But before we get to a discussion of success factors, let's consider the linguistic status of the deaf community a bit more. Deaf community, as initially defined in this uh, quote by Baker and Patton, 1974, deaf community comprises those deaf and hard of hearing individuals who share common language, common experiences and values, 
and a common way of interacting with each other and with hearing people. There is quite a bit of research on the differences between deaf culture and hearing culture when it comes to things like how close you stand, how far away you stand from the person you're having a conversation with, things you do and don't say, questions you can and cannot ask, what happens when you need to walk between two people who are having a sign language conversation. Hearing people are always reluctant to do that. Deaf people are like, come on, get through and get out of my way. So there are these things that separate the deaf community from hearing culture. Lane Hoffmeister and Bahan, 1996, in their book, The Journey into the Deaf World, talked about the notion of shared oppression, that the deaf community or any community has shared physical or cultural characteristics. Furthermore, that individuals are identified by themselves and others as member of a minority community, that they marry within the community and that they suffer oppression as a result of minority community membership. They also argued that the notion of colonized applies to the deaf community. Uh, we think of colonized as uh, something that happens to uh, countries when other countries uh, take over, but they actually think of this with respect to the deaf community as well. So for example, um, the agenda for life is determined by outsiders' best interests rather than what is best for the individual members of the community. The outsiders have the dominant roles. The deaf have subservient roles. Pupil, patient, client, employee, for example. And they note that professions serving the deaf survive based on an imbalance of power between them and the deaf. And this is their list of such professions. Program administrators, teachers, interpreters, speech language pathologists, audiologists, otologists, mental health and rehab counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, librarians, researchers, social workers, hearing aid specialists, and I would add linguists, but we qualify under the researchers, I think. Now, how does this outsider influence work? Well, for one thing, and this is true for pretty much all uh, disabilities, there's the federal law where ASL is viewed as an accessibility enterprise by the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. But everybody else also has attitudes towards deafness and sign language that differ from those that, towards other disabilities. And let me give a couple of examples of this. Parents don't say, I'm not going to let you let my child sit, whether the chair has wheels or not. My child is going to walk. And physical therapists don't say to the parents, you have a choice. You can pick the walking program or the wheelchair program. Yet to this day, parents and educators remain divided over whether the deaf children should be allowed to learn and use sign language. And I know that some of our uh, own people here on campus have had experience with clients coming in and saying, you're not gonna let my kid do that or my grandkid do that. So consider the source of these differences in attitudes. People can readily accept that the neuromusculature does not work. As a result, they don't think that it's unreasonable or a personal failure that someone cannot walk. 
In contrast, if you can control your mouth muscles, people think you ought to be able to speak. Because using sign language is viewed as a personal failure, that you're not motivated enough to learn to speak properly. So why is there this difference? Well, all hearing people learn spoken language from birth seemingly effortlessly. And while a staircase can be seen as an external barrier to someone in a wheelchair, with deaf people, the barrier is invisible and it's often discounted as not real. Oh, I know one thing that I did say um, that I forgot to re-say. Uh, on the issue of um, sign language being viewed as a personal failure, there are, I think, um, many people who are probably attending this talk who know better, but the um, uh, community outside of the university is not necessarily as up to date. And I know that we have had uh, clinicians who have had parents and grandparents say, you're not going to let my child or my grandchild do that, meaning use their hands. Okay, so people also still believe erroneously that sign language interferes with the acquisition of speech in English. Some educators play on this theme, suggesting that signing puts a wedge between parents and child. So I wanna give you a little bit of background history. Going back several hundred years, Sign language was used as the medium of instruction from the mid 1600s until 1880. A conference in Milan in Italy, mostly attended by hearing people. Deaf people were for the most part banned from being present. Uh, decided that sign language would no longer be used in the education of deaf children. It wasn't until the 1960s that the linguistic research on sign language as a language began again in earnest. And it was interesting at the time, it was observed that children with limited cognitive capacity who use sign often progressed to producing basic speech. And this then led to a resurgence of interest in using sign language for deaf children. So it wasn't originally uh, used for deaf children. And amazingly enough, a historical fluke, and you can ask me about this in the um, uh, question session if we have time, uh, left the Indiana School for the Deaf unscathed using sign language for decades. And it became a mecca for families who moved to Indy so their children could attend the school there. As recently as 2010, ISD was considered among the star schools for deaf education. And Indianapolis was noted for having the third largest deaf community in the country. So let me turn a little bit to the history of oppression since as Lane et al. suggested, the history of shared oppression is part of what binds the deaf community together. Deaf community is bound by its language, like any other minority community. And whereas members of other disability communities may feel overlooked or ignored, frustrated, members of the deaf community have recognized their shared experience with oppression and abuse, as seen by the hashtag lies AG Bell told my parents movement where A.G. Bell here refers to the Alexander Graham Bell Association. Okay. Let me turn also to some more shared experiences. There are state residential schools for the deaf and sometimes also the blind. There's a dedicated college, Gallaudet, Vocational Technical School, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. There's Deaf Olympics, Deaf sports teams, 
theater, National Theater of the Deaf, beauty pageants, Miss Deaf America, Miss Black Deaf America, artists, and other cultural associations. There are deaf doctors, nurses, veterinarians, lawyers, pilots, and I may be pushing my luck here, but we'll see if this works. Yes, it does. The Deaf Pilots Association, demonstrating to the world that deaf people can become pilots. Here, I focused on one deaf artist, Nancy Rourke. Like other deaf artists, her subject matter often is shared oppression. The A.G. Bell lies, A.G. Bell told my parents. This bottom one, see no deaf, hear no deaf, speak no deaf. And this larger one, hearing parents, blinded, deaf baby, hand wrapped so no signing can be used. And I am not sure because I haven't asked her if this red is blood from surgical implant but I suspect that's what it is. Okay, let me spend a few minutes on diversity in the deaf community uh, section. I've changed the color of the slides uh, since this is somewhat of an aside from Lane et al, The Deaf World, United by Language, Divided by Lots of Question Marks. So I'm just gonna give you a few uh, brief insights into some of the um, ways that the deaf community is also divided. Deaf World Diversity, Women, Asian Women's Association, Abused Women, Deaf Women Football Trials, Black Deaf, Segregation, there's a separate dialect from schools in the South. Racial discrimination, attitudes towards deafness, the triple heritage, American, Black, and Deaf. There's, as I mentioned, separate Miss, deaf, Miss Black Deaf America pageant. Since 1982, a National Black Deaf Advocates Group has been in existence. Hispanic Deaf, like Black Deaf, they're double minorities. With Black Deaf and the Hispanic Deaf together, constitute one third of deaf children in the United States. Black and Hispanic deaf are more likely to face discrimination, score below white peers on achievement tests, less likely to finish high school. If they finish high school, less likely to go to college, more likely to be tracked into vocational programs. Minorities are 37% of all deaf school children, <coughs> excuse me, but only 7% of teachers of the deaf. So the young children don't have models in the schools or the curriculum. On top of that, for the Hispanic children, you often need interpreters who can deal with ASL and Spanish and English. Since 1992, there's been a National Hispanic Council of the Deaf. Also, Asian and Pacific Island deaf is another conglomerate administrative convenience. There are 17 different groups that are included and whatever sign language may have been used by the families of those children before they came to the United States, they're unrelated to American Sign Language and they're not very useful. Since 1994, there's been an Asian Association of Deaf Americans. There's also Native De American Deaf, also diverse, disadvantaged and largely rural. 278 different reservations, 209 Alaskan villages, all different. Nearly half of children at, are at or below the federal poverty line. And since 1994, there's been an organization for Native American deaf. Then gay and lesbian deaf, 
since 1969, there's been an international organization of gay and lesbian deaf, the Rainbow Alliance of the Deaf. And I note that this is quite a bit earlier than the other organizations. 1969 was the same year as the Stonewall riots. 1992 saw the start of the Deaf Gay and Lesbian Coalition, providing peer counseling, support groups, community education, a hotline, and so on. Then there's Deaf Blind. The estimates range from 16,000 to 425,000. These are old numbers. I don't know what today's estimates would look like. Numerous communication systems are used in Deaf World ASL is preferred. That would be tactile ASL, the hands on top of the signer's wrists and hands. But there's a difference here too. You need one interpreter for every deaf blind person. Compare with sighted deaf, where one interpreter can work for a large audience, as we currently have. Thank you, Spencer. Um, it would not be that way for deafblind. And then there's multi-handicapped deaf. These are deaf people with additional disabilities, motor impairment, mental retardation, learning disabled, and emotionally disturbed. And questions arise, like how could you assess learning disability in the deaf if you don't have any idea what normal developmental um, progress would be for a deaf child when that deaf child is not developing normally in the acquisition of a language. Then there's the aging deaf and children of deaf adults, uh, CODAs. And, and final observation, leaders in the deaf community, when it comes to uh, between deaf and hearing people, late deaf and deaf people tend to be uh, leaders, but when it comes to grassroots, Culturally centered deaf people tend to be the leaders there. So now I'm going to turn to the last relevant bit of history. Um, Indiana House Bill 1367 in 2012. Funds were taken away from ISD to create an independent outreach center. It was claimed, it's not clear by who, that ISD outreach was biased towards using ASL. Parents wanted, in quotes, other more choices. That is for their children to learn spoken English without using ASL at all, which is why I gave you that example before of people don't go and say to a physical therapist, you're not gonna allow my child to sit. My child's gonna walk. No wheelchairs for my child, right? People don't do that. But for sign language, it's still happening. And the opposition from the deaf community was ignored. The bill was passed. And so where do I come in? Okay, I'm trained as a linguist and I've studied linguistic structure of several hundred languages, including, and these are not sign languages, Native American, African and Austronesian languages, as well as several sign languages or as I have had to say during my career, I know a language when I see one. Been doing research on deaf children's problems learning English since 1970. I'll do the arithmetic for you, that's 51 years. I can say I've demonstrated that it's not due to interference from sign language, as has been claimed. Between 1976 and 1985, I published 13 articles in a book documenting the problems arise from how deaf children are taught. That's an entirely separate discussion. And what seems to annoy me the most is that from 1986 to 2020, I've had to publish another 11 articles on another book, adding more documentation on top. And that's not even my main line of research, which is sign languages as natural languages. Okay, because the message isn't getting through. In 1975, my colleague Vita Charo and I published a paper entitled The Deaf Child is a Linguistic Minority. And we said, for all intents and purposes, however, a deaf child with no other handicaps is normal and very comparable in many ways to a minority child whose native language is not English. The catch is that the deaf child's normal modality for language is not auditory and oral, but visual and manual. 
In short, in that article 46 years ago, we laid out the argument for deafness as a linguistic minority with a language that stretches back several hundred years. Okay. I'm going to zip through the next slide to get on to and make up for, we can come back to that if we need to. So at the end of that article, we said, as long as deaf children are thought of as flawed hearing children who should be learning English, but who somehow cannot learn it properly, their chances of learning standard English and achieving in school are poor. But once deaf children are considered in the same light as other non-English speaking minority children with their own language, culture, and social conventions, their educational lot and their relations with the hearing world are bound to improve. So I was an optimist in 1975, but after the passage of the HB 1367 in 2012, I kind of got a little annoyed. So that led to a study by my uh, doctoral student, Eva Krustinsky and myself, academic achievement for deaf and hard of hearing children in an ASL English bilingual program. The aim was to determine the effects of ASL proficiency on reading comprehension and academic achievement, looked at the data from 85 students and divided them into two groups, high ASL proficiency and not high ASL proficiency, looked at standardized tests, and this is important, these were tests that were standardized on hearing students, because typically what happens is when you look at how deaf children are progressing, they are often compared to how hearing children are uh, or would be if they were hearing. And um, we wanted to use the data that showed which deaf children were uh, functioning like hearing children. So the Northwest Evaluation Association measures and the reading comprehension subtest of the Stanford Achievement Test. So findings, this isn't going to surprise you if you've been following what I'm saying, but the students that are highly proficient in ASL outperformed less proficient peers in reading comprehension, English language youth, and math. Here's a picture. On the left, not highly proficient. On the right, the highly proficient. This is the NWEA Northwest Evaluative Association's tests of reading, language use, and math. And the scale there, uh, percent correct, if you can't see that, the top number is 70%. So we're looking at anywhere from 40 to 65%, or 60% maybe, with the highly proficient, which is not great, but it's a whole lot better than the group that is not proficient in ASL. This is the picture for those students um, who took the SAT 10, not all of the students. And on the left, you see this large gray bar uh, is students who are below grade level in the not highly proficient category. The black bar is at grade level and the stripe bar is above grade level. So you can see again that the highly proficient group has fewer below grade level students, about half the number of at grade level and quite a bit more at the above grade level. So I wanna give you just a couple of numbers on the next two slides. These are the numbers of children in the two groups, not highly proficient and highly proficient, and the different rows are their reading proficiency. If they're below 40% score on the NWEA, they are considered not proficient. And if they're equal to or above 40%, they're in the reading proficient group. You can see that there is one child in the not highly proficient group who ended up in the reading proficiency group. And that's fine. But you can also see that there's 21 children in the highly proficient group who ended up in the reading proficient group. So to put this in another perspective, if you're not highly proficient in ASL from this study, you have a 3% chance of being in the reading proficient group. 
But if you're in the highly proficient ASL group, you have a 53% chance of being in the reading proficient group. Likewise for the math, right? 10% for the not highly proficient, 67.65% for the highly proficient math cell. So it's not just reading, it's also math. Finally, the regression model showed that ASL proficiency was the single variable that significantly predicted results on all the outcome measures. And this was including education, hearing devices, including aids and cochlear implants, secondary disabilities, ASL proficiency, and the home language. We concluded that study by saying this study calls for a paradigm shift in thinking about deaf education by focusing on characteristics shared among successful deaf signing readers, specifically ASL fluency. And if you compare that to what we said in 1975, once deaf children are considered in the same light as other non-English speaking minority children, their education a lot and their relations with the hearing world are bound to improve. You can see that we haven't really said terribly much more now than we had already said then. Um, I don't want to be totally negative on this, so I will just sum up here with the idea that big A here is not just accessibility, but also attitude. So we have lots of negative attitudes towards dialects and non-native speakers and stutterers and slow talkers and signers. I do think it would be good to, and I think this is where the DEI comes in because I think everything else with DEI is also attitude. Disability, accessibility, DEI, add the attitude on top of that. I'd like to leave you with a few Purdue alums who are deaf. We have, for example, Ray Martino who graduated with a master's in 2018 in aviation and aerospace management. He went to the California School for the Deaf in Riverside. And First Lieutenant Tinio has been a volunteer in the Civil Air Patrol, United States Air Force Auxiliary for over four years to gain more aviation experience while serving his country. He works for American Airlines. Sandra Wood is an assistant professor of linguistics at the University of Southern Maine. She got her bachelor's and master's at Purdue in linguistics and her PhD in linguistics from the University of Connecticut and is an ISD alum. David Geislin is the CEO and superintendent of the Indiana School for the Deaf. He got his bachelor's in linguistics from Purdue, his master's in deaf education from Boston University and his doctorate in secondary administration at IUPUI. He also attended ISD. And also we have Robin Shea, who is a continuing lecturer here at uh, Purdue in the School of Languages and Cultures. She also received her master's in linguistics from Purdue. So I would like to shout out and say kudos to the Purdue alums. Um, clearly Purdue is doing something right, even though I'm complaining constantly about what they're not doing. Uh, and again, I go back to attitude. And with that, I say thank you and any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilbur. We will definitely take some questions. We have a little bit of time left. Um, there is already one in the chat, but if you have others, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat and we can try to curate those and, and read them out. So Dr. Wilbur, the first one says, I appreciate your understanding of American Sign Language as part of diversity. Do you regard all disability as a matter of diversity and inclusion? Does deafness exist separately from other disabilities as a matter of social justice? Oh, no, definitely. Um... I think all disabilities, as I said, viewed from the social per perspective, all disabilities uh, are DEI issues. What I am saying is that on top of that, the deaf community fits a definition of another DEI issue, namely that of bilingual children, uh, bilingual adults, bilingual users of multiple languages. And as a result, there's a linguistic perspective on it 
that is not also found uh, with other disabilities. I hope that answers your question.